So greetings, everyone, and welcome to our 2023 speaker series presented by the New Jersey chapter of the Fulbright Association. Today, we are delighted to hear from Dr. Bruce Parker, Secretary of the Board of Trustees of New Jersey Fulbright. Dr. Parker retired as a software engineer in May 2020. He taught computer science prior to that, but he has a very wide range of interests and expertise, as you will learn this evening. The Fulbright Association is comprised of current and former recipients of Fulbright Awards and supporters of uh, international education in general. New Jersey has over 300 active Fulbright Alumni Association members and friends and thousands of people who live in New Jersey and have traveled abroad on Fulbrights. New Jersey has also hosted a great many Fulbright uh, foreign visitors um, who have come to study here and to live here uh, on Fulbrights and other educational exchanges. Uh, those exchanges benefit our state economically and culturally. Pre-pandemic, nearly 23,000 foreign students came to study annually at New Jersey's colleges and universities. Fulbrighters represent virtually every field of interest and come from over 165 countries. These exchanges are funded by appropriations from the US government and the governments of partner nations. What ties us all together is a commitment to advancing mutual understanding, tolerance, and peaceful relations worldwide. This speaker series invites members of the New Jersey chapter and their guests from time to time to share a glimpse of their individual projects and interest. In today's presentation, Dr. Parker describes his recent, <clears throat> excuse me, his recent visit to Namibia as a visiting astronomer. Thank you. Take it away, Bruce. All righty, uh, let me see if this sharing will actually work. Uh, there we go. I think it does. Pow. Uh, do, 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 do. Hmm. Okay, so I got that, but I don't have my notes. All right, so I'm gonna have to wing that part, I guess. Um, greetings. Um, I have notes for this, but apparently I'm not going to be able to see them. Uh, I'm not sure why that is, but uh, we'll just wing it as it is. So uh, what's going on here? Um, my uh, wife, Mary, and I have gone to Namibia twice in the last two years. Uh, once as a two-week road trip where we drove ourselves around. Um, and then the second time last uh, spring, uh, in Mar from March to May, where I was the resident astronomer at a lodge in the desert. So what's uh, interesting to me about this is I had originally decided, besides wanting to go to Africa, that I also want to see the night sky. But I really found I was very impressed with seeing the wildlife and the terrain and uh, the people as well in Namibia. So let's get started. Um, oh, that's interesting works differently than I expected. OK. <laughs> anyway, so um, this is OK. There we go. Sorry about that. I, the, the changes are going to be different from what I was practicing on. Anyway, um, so first things first, these are not great photographs. Uh, these are the best I could do. I'm not really a photographer. Uh, here are the different equipment I've used. Um, as you might guess, the uh, a telescope is used for some of the astronomical photographs we'll look at. Uh, an unfortunate number of these photographs were taken with my camera phone, um, but uh, I've tried to use the Sony when I could. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, some of the things that I had an opportunity to see were only available when I had the uh, camera phone. Oh, come on. There we go. All right. I guess I have to click it. All right. So here's the outline um, of where we're going on this. Let's start in the north and generally introduce what Namibia is about. So first things first, um, as I've repeatedly found, uh, not that many people know where Namibia is. <laughs> so here's a map of Africa. Uh, it's obviously in southwest uh, Africa. And it's bordered on the to the west by the Southern Atlantic Ocean, by the north uh, with Angola, to the east by Botswana, and to the south by South Africa. And there's also this little funny finger, and I'm not sure if this is going to show up here, but there's a finger sticking out here that heads towards Zambia and uh, uh, Zimbabwe. 
uh, and it stretches almost to Victoria Falls, not quite. In the north, uh, just to give you a general lay of the land here, uh, the capital you can see down at the bottom there is Vintok. To the west on the bay, we have Swakop Mund and Walvis Bay, which we'll see some pictures of in a minute. Uh, and then up the coast is something, a lovely area called Skeleton Coast, which is known for its shipwrecks, something that we missed because we had our first of two flat tires in our drive through the country. And then finally, there's this huge area up here, the Atosha National Park, which is an entirely fenced in wild animal area uh, that we'll see a lot of pictures from here. Um, this is actually one of my favorite pictures, which is a really a shame because I only had my camera phone at the time. I guess I could have dug out the better one, but this is what we got. So this is from um, a pass, and I, I apologize. I have it in my notes, but I can't see it. Um, <laughs> but it's a, we're looking down from an, an altitude of uh, considerable distance. It's about one kilometer up. And you can see the road off to the left here. It winds through. Uh, and descends one kilometer in just four kilometers. So it's like a 25% grade, it's very steep. Um, they warn you not to bring caravans or other things up here, just trucks and uh, woof. Anyway, beautiful area. We're looking out uh, over here to the, the uh, desert itself and at, at sunset. Um, though it's a very arid country, there are a lot of trees. Uh, this is this particular tree. I, if I recall correctly, it's a black acacia tree. Uh, it's also very old. It's estimated to be about a thousand years old. That's my wife there on the right. And here is a Mopani tree. Uh, Mopani trees are uh, favored by uh, the desert adapted elephants as one of their sources for water. Uh, it also is um, where um, uh, there are also these Mapani worms that are a delicacy, at least uh, if you're up towards the north in the, uh, the rainy season. Unfortunately, I haven't had a chance to try one. Um, this is in Damaraland at the Lodge of Doro Nawas. Uh, we're looking at sunset from the lodge, which is up on a hill, and you can see the various huts down below. That's where individual guests were staying like we did. And here's the Atosha Pond. I mentioned that there's the Atosha National Park. This is kind of the central area here. It is a salt plain. It's about a quarter of the size of Lake Ontario. So it's enormous. In the winter, there's actually some water in there. Uh, or I say winter, in our winter, in their summer. Uh, um, you know, there's water there. But when we were there in the uh, fall, that was not the case. We can stop saying fall. We were there in October, let's say that. So let's start by looking at some animals. Um, in Wallace Bay, uh, we took a boat ride out to the seal colony. And along the way, we had some pelicans who uh, were insisting on being fed. Here's the sea colony itself. I don't remember what the numbers are, but there's like tens of uh, thousands of these uh, out here. Uh, in addition, there are dolphins and whales in the water. And unfortunately, in our case, we saw one lone uh, pelican actually maybe not pelican, a penguin uh, that was probably doomed. And here's one of the uh, befriended seals that uh, uh, jumped up onto the boat in order to be fed. And that's my wife again. So let's go back to land and look at some of the uh, more amazing animals here. And we're gonna start with actually probably the most uh, special one. And this is called the Oryx or Gemsbach. Um, this is the national animal of Namibia. And if you look at its face and its markings, uh, frankly, it looks like it's ready for Kabuki theater. They are also very territorial. Uh, here is one that is uh, stopping us as we're trying to head back to our lodge. And you eventually got out of the way, but it took quite a while doing that. This is a um, social weaver's nest, which is a type of bird. And they build almost like an apartment building, uh, this sort of colony of uh, nests that they simply add on to uh, as the uh, number of tenants, if you like, grows. Um, 
we were warned about the possibility that snakes might fall out of it. This is an occupied nest, so that's not a problem. Uh, but when they are unoccupied, they sometimes uh, have snakes come in and then the birds chase them out. And of course the snakes fall down, which is, means my wife would be in trouble if that was the case because she's standing underneath there. This is a hornbill who joined us for lunch. Excuse me, for breakfast. This is a secretary bird. Uh, they hunt snakes. And they're and it's doing out in this field in the Tosha. You can also see that there's, you know, despite the fact that it's mostly desert, there's actually grass here in the Tosha as well. Here's a giraffe eating leaves off the top of a tree. I find I really like uh, uh, giraffes. Giraffes are very elegant, uh, but they're also a little bit awkward when it comes to bending down and drinking water from a, a watering hole. And as a result, you'll notice that they don't do that all together at the same time because at least a couple of them are out looking out for possible predators. And speaking of predators, here is a spotted hyena, uh, probably about a, mm, let's say maybe 50 meters away. Uh, here they are again. Uh, this is at night, we're much closer, perhaps 10 meters away. Um, in this case, you're looking at a two uh, hyenas and a bunch of jackals who are tearing apart a, uh, a springbok. And in the background, there's a, uh, a rhinoceros who doesn't care and is just drinking from the watering hole. I should point out, by the way, that the hyenas uh, will take a bite and then look up immediately because they're always afraid that a lion will come and, and take their food. Here is a jackal all by itself, though uh, it actually was trying to hang out and see if it could get some handouts from us while we were having brunch. Uh, this is a, uh, an impala, or actually a bunch of impalas. You can identify in part by their, their horn shape and their coloring. This, oddly enough, is, is something you'll see a, a lot of places around northern Namibia, and that is a termite mound. It's about two meters high, uh, so they're enormous. And uh, it's just amazing how many of these you're going to see. <laughs> This is a uh, armored cricket. Um, I think it comes by other names as well. Um, in case you can't tell the scale, that's sitting on our um, uh, uh, the, the ledge up front of our, our room. So it's maybe about uh, 10 centimeters long. So it's, it's, it's pretty large. Here's a kudu. You notice they look different like than the other guys. It has a horn similar to the impala, but the markings are different. It has a, a beard and other things. I really got around to liking ostriches. Uh, they're, I find them much more interesting than you would ever think from being in a zoo, for example. Um, they, uh, they, uh, if they have the chance, they tend to have large broods of children. Um, they are also very dramatic. They, uh, we, ha we had a chance, for instance, to see through binoculars, at least, uh, a mating going on. Um, they get very dramatic and they end up running around and flapping their wings when they're upset about something and trying to get their way on stuff. It's, it's kind, of, kind of amusing. Uh, here's an example of that, sort of. Uh, on, this is a watering hole in the middle here. Um, and you can see a group of young ostriches off to the left, and they're waiting patiently for their turn to get to the watering hole, which is currently occupied by a herd of oryxes. I hope you can see that picture because you know, it's a little small. This is a gecko that was at my at the observatory. Which we'll show you in a bit. And here's a grass snake. Uh, which, in case you're curious, is not poisonous. These are springbok, or smaller. And here are some uh, warthogs that were actually at our camp, and they're rooting around on their knees, uh, digging up stuff in the ground. 
This is a zebra. Um, and I'll say two things about this. There's a second type of zebra called the Hartman mountain zebra, uh, which looks differently and uh, is more frequently, uh, very hard to, to normally see. I, I've heard that they have them even in Atosha, but I don't recall. I went through all my photographs. I didn't see any that I had recorded. Um, because there are, the markings are different, for example. Um, the other comment about this is this is the last time that I jumped out of our truck to take a photograph of this because I remembered that that was not advisable to do that in Atosha because of the uh, predators, um, something which I remembered the next day when we finally saw one of them. Um, unfortunately, all the pictures I have of rhinoceroses are at night. Um, so here's, here's some of them uh, in mother and, and a baby. At the water at a watering hole. And there are also wildebeest. Lots of wildebeest. And this is why I didn't want to jump out. So the second day we were in Atosha, um, we stopped uh, at a point where we could see off in the distance that there were two lionesses uh, resting themselves in the shade uh, at around noontime. Uh, having they had just killed a zebra. Um, and now I was quite happy that uh, uh, I was remembering that not, not to get out. Um, the picture is not that great. It's cropped. It, I've tried to enhance it a bit. Um, and that's because we're about 100 meters away. And this time I'm looking through the window of the truck in order to take the picture. Um, <laughs> so it's the best, best I could hope for given, given the circumstances. And here are some male lions who are just kind of resting at the end of the day. This is much later in a different day. Um, the one on the right is lying on its back, looking like it wants a belly rub. Uh, oddly enough, no one was interested in giving him one. And this is probably the most scary picture of the entire trip. This is a leopard. Leopards are apparently somewhat touchy, so that they feel um, upset about things. Even if they're not hungry, they can kill you. Um, and what's particularly disconcerting, disconcerting about this is those other times we saw the lions, we were quite a distance away. We're at a distance of about five meters here. <laughs> and I am sitting in an open truck, no glass doors or anything like that. Uh, and I am on the side facing towards it. And suddenly I got a coughing fit. And fortunately he decided that that was not the time to kill me. So, yay. But there's also another reason why he didn't do it. And that was, he went back to his spot where he had a, uh, his kill for the day, which was an impala, or what was left of one. Um, I can't show you a video of that, but uh, nonetheless, that's uh, what he was doing. Uh, when he got done, he took grass from the surrounding area and covered over uh, the kill in order to prevent the smell from uh, attracting other predators. And here we finally come to my favorite animal. Uh, the elephants or the Ellies, as they sometimes call them. Um, these guys are amazing. Uh, they are enormous, of course. Uh, African elephants, if you aren't aware of the difference, have the bigger ears. They also tend to get much larger. Um, I mean, the, the babies are like a ton. The females, I think, are like three or four tons. The bulls are supposed to be up to like six tons. Um, so in a fight with a, uh, uh, a one-ton vehicle, you are going to lose. Uh, and that's, that's kind of a, an important uh, thing to pay attention to. So here's a baby and mother. Babies are so cute. And here we are at a watering hole with a uh, troop uh, that's being led by two females. And the one on the left um, has a bunch of mud on it because that's what they do. They want to cool off by putting mud on themselves sometimes. And uh, she's going to come right up to the truck and take a peek inside just to check us out and this is just before she did that <laughs> and the woman on the left obviously got a much better better shot than, than i did actually this is uh, i take that back this is my wife's photograph sorry about that um so one odd thing we've always know about we always think of a herd of elephants as being very loud but in fact Every time I've seen them, they've been very quiet. So here we have a herd of what, maybe 30 elephants. They came in so quietly, it was like a pantomime. Uh, it was just amazing. So here's a watering hole, in case you can't tell what you're looking at there. 
uh, and they all come in at night and they're looking at, uh, they're, they're uh, uh, getting water. And then finally, here's the last picture from a uh, that we had from Atosha at sunset. Uh, and actually, we didn't make it out in time before they closed the gates, but we have our elephant. Actually, off to the left there is, are the two lions that we saw before. So let's head south. So um, when we head south, uh, you'll see that there's this huge area here, uh, which is the Namib Desert. And we'll zoom in a bit on that. In particular, you may have noticed this particular feature here or is it this long pointy thing sticking out? This is actually the Sao Cheb River, which is an ephemeral river. Uh, and at the end, we have an area called Sosa's Clay, uh, which we'll show you some pictures of in just a moment. Over here is actually the lodge where we stayed at. And we'll show you more about that in just a second too. So here's the big deal with the uh, Sosa's Clay. Um, over the years, um, uh, well, maybe I should back up a little bit because I've forgotten some of my notes. Uh, the desert, for instance, is supposed to be about um, 80 million years old. They're kind of vague about the estimate there, but some, somewhere on the order of 60 to 80 million years old. Um, there's a deposit of all this material here that's formed these dunes, and these are enormous. Uh, some of them are, I think, are almost a kilometer high, if I recall rightly. Uh, in case you need scale, obviously you get a little bit of by seeing the trucks down the bottom. Uh, halfway up, you can see some smudges. Those are people walking up the top of that, that dune. So it's very, very big. Also, the colors are really extraordinary. We're, we're doing this at just after dawn. Um, so the sun has just risen. And again, smaller dunes, beautiful colors. And an, another one. There's also another area um, which is another pan called Deadly. Um, so this is an area that sometimes gets water, but in fact, the ground is so um, uh, salty and such that all these um, um, uh, trees here look quite dead. In fact, they're quite old as well. So you have some kind of remarkable looking landscapes with these tr dead trees. Here's another one. I should say this kind of reminds me of the persistence of time by Dolly, because <laughs> you're not thinking that same way too. Of course, he's referring to something in Spain, not in Namibia. So here's a, a zoomed in image uh, from Google Maps showing what the uh, lodge looks like. Uh, the main lodge is sitting here, and these are all the individual places. Our spot was over here in the small set of buildings. Uh, this guy right here is the observatory, which is up on the other side of the road and a little bit up the hill. So this is a big plain off to the southwest here, and here's a hill going to the northeast. Uh, here's a view to the north uh, where you can see the other part of the camp. This is also where the uh, water source is, and it has to be piped over the hill uh, down this way. And here's the northwest corner of, that, of the lodge again, peeking out behind the hill. So one of the great things with, with Africa, frankly, are the sunrises and sunsets. So let's show you some of that. Here is the sunrise, looking at the plain uh, outside of the lodge. This is done as a panorama shot, by the way. Here's a sunset. The sun going down behind the mountains over there. Uh, here is a sunrise. Uh, while we're waiting for a, a hot air balloon to take off. In case you've never done hot air balloons, they always tend to do them first thing in the morning unless, or, or uh, at the end of the day. Uh, this is the view from our room in Damaralan. So there are elephant tracks outside because that's where the desert elephants are. And some other uh, sunset pictures. So I'm just gonna go through these. Brilliant colors, just amazing stuff. All right, so let's look at some stuff at nighttime. I'm, I'm fortunately, I'm, I'm, let me see if I get my notes here. I'm gonna have to pause for a second. I wanna make sure I, I can at least uh, see my notes. <laughs> uh, 
because I'm not I'm not seeing that right now. If I don't, I'm going to forget some things. I'll just take this moment to uh, say, if anyone has questions, please put them in uh, the chat. Um, we'll have a little time to talk about this afterward. I know I'm seeing things that I don't know the names of, and I'm going to have to ask some questions too. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm, I, I apologize. I should have said something about that earlier. But um, I did want to allow for, for people to do things. I, I, I think I can finish this relatively quickly. Um, okay, so I don't seem to be able to bring up my notes. Um, so unless I can find some way of doing that, uh, I got a problem. <laughs> um, Captions. You know, Bruce, you could tell us anything and we'll believe it. I know, but I, I, I had information I was trying to share too. Anyway, so whatever. Um, I'll, you're right. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll go with that. So anyway, here are three. Uh, uh, here's the observatory itself. It has this nice little, um, um, these cushions around all around the, in a circle. So people can kind of lean back and look up, uh, which is really what it's about. I, I try to encourage when people were there to spend uh, 10 minutes just getting used to the dark uh, so you can see things better. Uh, unfortunately, our nemesis is in the background, which is the moon. Uh, when the moon is not up, you can see the Milky Way very clearly. Uh, and that's one of the more remarkable things about being at this spot. So we have three different scopes. The one with the cover on it is a Mead, which I didn't tend to use because it was pretty cranky. Slightly less cranky is the, um, or well, generally less cranky was the Celestron you see on the right, which is big 11 inch uh, Schmidt Cassegrain. And then we have in the middle the telescope I actually brought with me from, from the US and survived the trip and all of that. And uh, uh, this is what I tended to show people with, with looking at deep sky images, which we'll take a look at in just a bit here. So uh, here is my warm room, which is my office. Uh, which is where I spent a good portion of the afternoons at least. So uh, we're going to take a look at some shots of the moon here first. And this is mostly because this is the sort of thing that I, we found kind of interesting. Um, the very fact that you have very clear skies here means that I can take photographs on nine consecutive nights and still be able to you know, continually show stuff, uh, which is kind of amazing. Um, the other is uh, that in, in that process, the, you, there's an area here where it goes from light to dark, right? and that will change each night. And on each, and as that happens, the, uh, there are different uh, uh, features on the moon that are illuminated. You can see here, for instance, there are craters. Uh, if, I blue, if I blew this up better, you could actually see mountains as well. Uh, so let's just do that and just show you what I'm talking about here. So here we are, it's moving across. I think that's it. Yeah, I think that's it. So um, if this were an astronomy presentation, I would ask you what's wrong with these pictures. <laughs> but I'm not going to do that to you. And what's wrong is these are upside down. <laughs> that is, if you were to look at the, if you go out tonight, and look at the moon. Well, actually, it's just past full, so it'll be different anyway. But uh, you'll notice that all, the entire image you're looking at here is upside down. Now, that's not the way the people in the southern hemisphere view this. Uh, they view it as perfectly fine. But we have kind of an inherent prejudice uh, because 85% of the world's population lives above the equator, which I didn't know. But that's kind of an interesting fact. And if you, it takes a little bit to realize that. But yeah, like so, for instance, in Africa, the three biggest countries are what? Nigeria, Ethiopia, and uh, Egypt. Um, they're all above the equator. <laughs> um, if you head west, uh, well, you get Brazil, that's the southern hemisphere, obviously, and Argentina and Chile. Um, but by the time you get to the uh, Far East, um, even Singapore is north of the equator. 
Um, so yeah, you get uh, uh, Indonesia, which is huge, uh, and, and Australia, uh, but you know, no India, no, no, uh, Mal not really much, of Mal not really Malaysia. Um, I mean, it's uh, well, you're part of Malaysia anyway. Uh, but anyway, so, and you don't get India, more importantly. Um, so yeah, fifteen percent of the world's population lives below the equator, and we tend to. Um, as a result, I have kind of a, a bias towards viewing things one particular way. All right. So uh, in May of 2022, the four planets were kind of aligned. So you can so I got up at a fairly early hour, I think it was about four in the morning, and you could see all four of them here. So we have Jupiter and Venus very close together at this time, followed by Mars and then Saturn. So one of the things that's wild with being in uh, Namibia, especially in the desert, is it's very, very dark. Uh, there's a scale called Bortle, and this is Bortle 1, um, so meaning that it's pretty much as, as dark as it's going to get. I think there's only one other designated dark sky location in Africa, and that's in Botswana. Uh, uh, so when you're looking at the sky, there's just an amazing amount of stuff that you can see that here with the naked eye that you just can't see anyplace else. And it kind of reminded me here of, of the Van Gogh painting of Starry Night, just because, uh, yeah, this is supposed to be an exaggeration, but eh, with, in Namibia, I'm not so sure about that. So uh, here is one of the things I really like to show people, and one of the reasons why um, the moon is kind of a problem is uh, you can't see this guy, <laughs> which is the Milky Way. Now, this particular image is not it's probably more than what you'd see with, even with the naked eye this is a sequence of 16 second images that i've also enhanced a bit and then stitched together uh, so it's, you're looking pretty much from uh horizon to horizon here um i'm gonna hope my pointer is working um this is the a little bit to the left of the center is the center of the galaxy and you notice there's a lot of dark stuff here right that's dust and when we look at even some other galaxies that obviously won't be as clear, uh, you can see other dust lanes uh, on, on those uh, as well. And that's just part of what makes up our galaxy. In fact, uh, a lot of galaxies. Um, the, there are tribes in uh, like the Aborigines in, in Australia, the uh, Incas in, um, uh, in uh, Chile who, um, actually make up stories about the shapes they see in the dark there. Um, and they, they, I mean, like the Incas, for instance, talk about there being a serpent and other things like that. So um, interesting that they, they focus on that, not on trying to do things that like we do in the Western society of, of, uh, of uh, constellations of stars. Though they do pay attention to stars. Uh, over on the right here, you notice it's a little bit green. Uh, that's um, so, uh, something called air glow. Uh, which is just because we're looking through a lot of air at this point. And a little bit to the left of that is the Southern Cross. Um, so this is four stars. Unlike Polaris, this is not where the Southern uh, Celestial Pole is, but it points to it. It actually points to a position that's slightly off of this picture right here that's down this way. Um, and slightly to the left of this, the Southern Cross is a big, dark nebula called the Coal Sack, C-O-A-L. Um, and obviously there are other ones around here too, but this is kind of the most remarkable one. So those are the three things I always try to show people at the beginning is the Milky Way, the Southern Cross, and the Coal Sack. So uh, what else I mention here? Here's our home, it's our galaxy. It's uh, 90,000 light years across. It's about 13 billion years old, which means it's almost as old as the universe itself. Um, it's kind of an amazing thing to see. Um, I mean, even if for a lot of people when they go someplace really dark, this is kind of a, like a once in a lifetime experience because we just don't see this sort of thing anymore. So here's a peak. This is, uh, uh, here's where I'm gonna have to see how much I remember of things. Uh, this is Messier 24, uh, which strictly speaking is not a star cluster. Rather, it's an opening uh, in the dust uh, near the middle of the galaxy that allows us to see to the far side. So we can see about 10,000 light years away. Um, and it's just kind of remarkable just how many stars you can see uh, uh, when you try even a little bit here. So 
So there are a number of star clusters and uh, maybe it's just as well I don't remember the names of all these guys. <laughs> That's just gonna end up being a little bit annoying. So let me just skip through this. Uh, there, there, so here's, here are some different star clusters. These are somewhat famous. There are also ones that are particular to the Southern skies. And I think this was the jewel box, if I remember correctly. And that's, uh, yeah. And this, I can't remember which one this is. Sorry. <laughs> so I had too much of a crutch trying to remember these guys. All right. So let's look at some other types of clusters. So star clusters have the feature that they're groups of stars that are about the same age and move together in a group. But there is another type which are called globular clusters. And globular clusters are actually in some ways more interesting. Um, they are sort of like small galaxies. There tend to be uh, not just maybe a, a couple hundred stars but ten, tens of thousands, even millions of stars. They also are in orbit around the Milky Way. That is, they're not really in the Milky Way itself. They're in orbit about it. So here's one. Here's another. And let's finally get into some of the nebulae. So uh, one of the other things you especially can see in, um, uh, in night sky are, are these uh, uh, nebulae, which are the result of either uh, stellar explosions, nova, or there's simply collections of dust that have been left over from that and they're in a star forming region. This is Messier 1, which is the first uh, object in the Charles Messier's catalog of nebulae. Uh, Charles Messier was more concerned, oddly, with comets, and he was tired of bumping into all of these fuzzy objects. And so he decided to make a catalog of things he wanted to exclude from this, looking for comets. And this is the first one. So this is actually fairly famous as well. This is the uh, Crab Nebula. Uh, it is one of three. I think, um, uh, supernova that have been visible, have been viewed uh, on Earth uh, in the last thousand years. This, I think, was in 1054. Uh, there are notations from Chinese astronomers about this. Uh, there's even notes on um, from the Anasazi uh, in, uh, south, in the southwestern United States that apparently have some indication about uh, this uh, explosion. Uh, it was so bright, by the way, you could see it during the day. I mean, that's that's why <laughs> you know this was a big deal, and it went on for like a, uh, several weeks that way. So here are some of the other nebulae. I apologize for these pictures. I need to work on trying to improve them. It's a limitation of what the telescope can do, but the colors are really neat, so that kind of makes up for it. This is the uh, Omega Nebula. This is part of the uh, um, Messier series. Uh, this is the Eagle Nebula. And in the middle here, we have something which was kind of dubbed the Pillars of Creation because of a photograph taken by the Hubble telescope some 20 years ago. Um, it is a star forming region also. Um, actually, I think I got that wrong. This is the Omega Nebula. This is why I wish I had my, my uh, yeah, the other one was Lagoon. This is Omega, sorry about that. I'm getting these backwards. So I need my notes. So here's the um, Trifid Nebula. And this actually is kind of neat because it shows three types of nebula at once. We have the emission nebula uh, that's in red there. That's hydrogen, uh, the most common element in the universe. Uh, on the left, we have an area that's blue. This is, uh, and it's blue because the star in the middle here is blue. And it's shining, uh, creating that light. And then we also see these lovely black or dark areas. This is a dark nebula sitting in front of our, our viewpoint here. Actually, can I go backwards? I probably can't. Oh, I can't. Okay, good. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let me make one other comment here. So just remember part of my notes here. Uh, this is about 7,000 light years away. We think about 6,000 light years uh, 6,000 years ago, excuse me, there was a supernova that exploded somewhere in this region and it uh, destroyed the pillars of creation. 
um, it will take us another thousand years before we find out about that. <laughs> Um, and that's an important concept here. This object that we're looking at is 7,000 light years away. That means that the light we're looking at is 7,000 years old. So one of the unique features about dealing with astronomy is you're actually, it's like a time machine. You're looking at things that are from very long ago. The further out it is, the further back in time it is. That's why when they talk about the uh, James Webb, Webb telescope looking back to the beginning of time, it's because it's looking at things that are so, so far away. Uh, this is the Running Man Nebula. I don't know if that really looks like a Running Man there. And I do not remember which one this is. Sorry, <laughs> ignore that. I think though that that previous one is part of one that we'll look at better in a bit. This guy, I don't remember the number for it, but it's sometimes called the Battling Dragons, which has to do with stuff going on in the middle here, which I don't have a very good image of, something I need to work on the next time I go back. So before we look at some galaxies, um, here's a supernova that happens to pop up. Uh, I mentioned before about the supernova in our galaxy, but there are also supernovas that are going on in other galaxies. Um, this one, I'm not quite sure which galaxy that is, but it's in one of the two of them you see here. There's one galaxy there and another bigger galaxy right there. So galaxies, this is M83, the southern um, uh, pinwheel, I think. Um, some nice structure there. You can see with the, the different arms of the, of the, uh, the spiral. Here's another spiral galaxy. And this one I do know, this is uh, the Sombrero galaxy, which is a terrible name, but notice this really lovely dark lane here that splits it in two. Uh, that's kind of amazing that you can see that. Another spiral galaxy. And this is actually a collision between two galaxies. Uh, These are called the antenna galaxies. There's supposed to be some long, um, arms that extend out here, uh, which unfortunately this image doesn't show. So uh, this happens more often than you think. For instance, we we are pretty sure by this point that the formation of our solar system was due to a galaxy merging with the Milky Way galaxy. And that's because, and part of the reasoning for that is that, remember we said that our galaxy is 13 billion years old, but our solar system is only 5 billion years old. So something happened 5 billion years ago that changed it. A, another galaxy, I think this is the uh, Needle Galaxy. This is the Whale Galaxy. And there's another smaller galaxy that's being perturbed by it. I can't remember which one this is. Um, that's a very pretty one anyway. By the way, in case you're noticing here, when we're looking at this, those stars that are uh, in the image are in front of us. That is, we're looking through this, think of it as like looking through a snowstorm and we can finally see what the galaxy looks like. Those are not, they're not actually close to the, uh, the galaxy we're looking at. Oh, and I should have, ah, there's one other thing I would have mentioned had I had my notes. These th objects are millions of light years away, right? So they're not close at all, but this is, uh, uh, um, Omega Centauri, I think. Uh, so this is a, another brilliant one, with a lovely uh, dark patch going through the middle. And finally, we end up with the last couple of things. I try to show these to everybody in the South because these are, uh, again, unique to stuff from the Southern Hemisphere. This is uh, 47 Tucani, which is a, a big um, uh, globular cluster. This is the uh, Tarantula Nebula which it's not even in our galaxy. This is in another galaxy that's sort of in orbit around the Milky Way called the Large Magellanic Cloud. Uh, it's about 160,000 light years away. So it's not quite as far as those other guys, but it's kind of amazing, which also means this thing is enormous because it is so far away. And this is Eta Carinae, or at least the center of it. This is a has a big variable star here that uh, uh, is very bright. And we think it's going to go supernova sometime yeah, sometime. Pretty sure it's going to. It was very bright back in the mid 19th century. We'll probably do it again. Whoops. And I just missed my favorite picture. This is Omega Centauri. This is the largest uh, globular cluster that we have in our galaxy. 
Uh, it's in orbit, of course, like the others, so it's about 10,000 light years away. Uh, this thing is enormous. It, we think there's about 10 million stars in it, and it is so big that it has uh, its own uh, black hole in the middle. Uh, by the way, our galaxy has a black hole in the middle too. Um, and uh, we also think that it may be the leftover core of another galaxy that uh, at one point merged with uh, or passed through the, the uh, Milky Way. And that is it. I want to see more. Um, I've got some of these better pictures in better shape uh, elsewhere if you want to see that. Maybe we'll have to wait for the sequel to this. But... Uh, maybe. <laughs> So tell us about, uh, this is how we can get in touch with you or learn yeah. more, see more pictures. Yeah, um, email, obviously, if you need that. I put up a bunch of the, uh, higher quality images on Flickr. Uh, occasionally, I put stuff on Instagram. I don't really use it too much. Uh, but yeah, I dumped a, a lot of these pictures onto, onto Flickr if you want to see it there. OK. I guess I can look at the chat or the QA also, can I? Well, that apparently the chat hasn't been working. So uh, we, have oh. our, we have our questions in the Q&A. And Anthony Lunn has, a, has a, a heavy duty question for you here. Oh, okay. Uh, or can you read that? Yeah, I can see it. Uh, oh, wow. Um, huh. So the question is, uh, tell us about the politics of Namibia and what is the legacy of the German and South African occupations? Uh, how is this country doing economically? Uh, uh, they are, I, I would say the German legacy is that there are a lot of, as I mentioned, there's a lot of uh, German culture there. Uh, there are towns along the coast like Lutteritz and other places that, uh, and uh, Swakop Moon that have a lot of German architecture. Um, as well as uh, a, a lot of, uh, of food and other kind of cultural things as well, which is kind of interesting. Um, I was even told that if I was going to learn another language in, um, um, in Namibia, that I shouldn't learn Afrikaner, but I should instead learn German, <laughs> which I don't know how really useful that is. I really want to learn Afrikaner. So that's actually my next goal for the next couple of months, to start working on Afrikaner. Um, so uh, occupations, well, the uh, uh, part of the problem with, with uh, well, so uh, there's one of the results is that the South African uh, rand is still accepted in the currency there. So it's, they're still pretty economically tied together. Um, Namibia as a whole is very dependent upon tourism. Uh, they're trying to get away from that. Unfortunately, they may be going down the same route as some other countries. Uh, as they've just found a number of big oil uh, deposits off the coast. And um, hopefully they don't go, become another Nigeria or, well, even Angola's got its problems. Angola is, is, is actually relatively wealthy compared to Namibia. Uh, and that's, that's a problem too. Um, in the cities, for instance, you're more likely to see crime uh, out in the countryside because it's, it's so sparsely populated. Uh, that's not an issue. Um, I should say, by the way, Namibia is supposed to be the second least densely populated country in the world uh, after Mongolia. Um, so it's, uh, yeah. So I, I don't know as much about the current politics as I probably should. I should mention, though, that uh, you may actually remember, for those of you who are older, like me, uh, that there was an organization called SWAPO, Southwest uh, African um, Political Organization. I think I can remember how that all that worked out. But anyway, um, so there's there's some socialist leanings there, uh, which is, I mean, that's, that's okay, because they're trying to figure out how to share the wealth. And that's part of the thing with the uh, oil is they're trying to set up a, uh, um, uh, what do they call that? I was going to say a national fund that, that uh, uh, is meant to help uh, poor people in, in the country. So. Bruce, would you like to uh, stop sharing uh, screen and then we can see you a little bit better as you're talking? Oh, okay, sorry about that. There you go. Okay, uh, Fiona has a, just a, a, a note to you here. Thank you, Bruce, for your in-depth knowledge and super pictures in love with Africa. And when are you going back? I'm currently planning on going back in July. Uh, which will be a different season. Um, 
just to remind you, our summer, our summer is their winter. So I'm actually going in, in the coldest time of the year, uh, which is given that it's Namibia is not that cold. Um, it does get down to maybe freezing at night, but that's you know that's a feature of uh, being in a desert that uh, the temperature changes wildly uh, from the day to the night. Uh, still gets up to uh, so they they can have like 20, 30 degree centigrade uh, temperature changes during uh, during the course of the day. I have found that staying up all night, for instance, uh, which I've done a couple of times, like it gets pretty freaking cold. Um, so. Uh, I, I, I found I was better off going into that warm room, which was not actually heated. It just happened to retain a lot of heat. Um, but yeah, we're playing. Uh, we're going to go back for I think three months from uh, July to uh, uh, beginning of October, something like that. Well, that's terrific. Uh, anybody else have any questions that they'd like to stick into the Q and A there? Okay, well, I'll tell you that that was really interesting. I feel like I've made a little trip there, and and now I want to take a big trip there. It's true. So, um, we we took kind of uh, not that there are different ways of doing it. The most expensive things we I, we saw some fairly wealthy people flying in every place to, to uh, get around. Uh, I actually kind of like the driving, though. As I mentioned, we had two flat tires, um, which is not fun. Um, but that's also a sign of how rough some of the roads are. Uh, um, and that's funny because they, uh, people I know talked about how wonderful the roads are in Namibia compared to other countries. So I'm thinking, oh my God, you know, I've, I've heard stories about that like in Zambia where the roads are just really, really bad. Um, so uh, yeah, the, it's, uh, so the cheaper way, uh, the cheaper than what we did is to rent a, um, uh, gosh, I can't remember what to call. I was going to say it's a caravan, but it's it's kind of a uh, a van with a pop up top. Uh, so the tent is actually off the ground. It's on the roof of the van, uh, and you see a lot of of Africans driving around that way. They also, by the way, have one thing we didn't have, which was to have two spare tires, <laughs> which <laughs> I can strongly recommend. Yeah, good thinking. Hey, tell me a little bit about the um, the astronomical observatories, and are you a member of a, a group that? Does this in different parts of the world or? No, this was kind of an accident. I had, as part of the trip that we did. Uh, so yeah, I'm actually a member of different groups. Uh, and one of the things that was recommended to me was to see about going to the uh, South African Astronomical Observatory, which obviously is in South Africa. Um, I really want to do that. But um, uh, yeah, we found out about this by accident. Uh, when I set up the time to go there, I was just trying to make sure that we got there when the moon was not bright. Um, and um, they warned me that there was no astronomer there. So I was like, oh, okay, then fine. I will just go up and do this myself. So I invited other people to come up and join me with stuff. And we even had some of the staff up there. So that was kind of fun. We even had a meal up there, which is kind of weird, but um, uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun. And they invited me back uh, to, to be a resident astronomer. Now, what that means is, uh, they didn't pay me. I was I was uh, uh, there as a guest, uh, but that that was kind of extraordinary by itself. So we had food, uh, uh, a room and board for the time we were there, and we have to pay for flights there. Uh, but other than that, it's it's all free, I guess. Uh, so that was that was kind of fun. I would I would love to do it again. I, if I can find other places where I can do this, I'd, I'd love to. I've, I've known of people doing this sort of thing at different um, national parks around our country. Um, uh, and sometimes they even advertise those positions. I'm, I'm not sure if they pay them, probably not. I think they're just looking for good people. So, I mean, myself, for instance, I'm a member of both, both NJAA and the uh, UACNJ, which is in Jenny Jump. And uh, so in the summer, at least, we have these things on like Saturday night where we'll, and we'll be open to the public and people come in and, and we take a look at things. Well, it, it really is a fascinating pastime, fascinating pastime that you've got there and uh, or second career or third career. Uh, and I'm wondering where you're going to be going to play the cello. Ah, no, no one gets to hear me do that anytime soon. I've got a long ways to go. Yes, for those of you who don't know it, yet another one of, of Bruce's interests is playing the cello. So, well, thank you so much, Bruce. We really appreciated this. It was a 
just fascinating um, and uh, worth worth all of the trials and tribulations of trying to get the aspect ratio right. Because ah. it turned out perfectly, even if you didn't have your notes. Yeah, sorry, I could have I could have bored you with more details on this. No, this this was great. Thank you so much, and thank you everybody who uh, who came along. If we don't have any other questions, we can call it a night. Thank you all. Hey, thanks. And we'll see you at the next seminar. Bye-bye.